Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You lack one thing, Jesus says, as a recovering perfectionist. That phrase makes me cringe. Anytime I hear it, I have to pause and practice my deep breathing and allow my heart rate, which has skyrocketed, to slow to a reasonable pace once again. I've spent much of my life consciously and subconsciously working to avoid criticism. I've racked up achievements and honors and awards and grades that would make any parent proud and I've invested countless hours and tears and efforts working towards success, whatever that means. I try very hard not to make mistakes, to only produce excellence, to earn respect and goodwill from those I'm around. Maybe you hear that and you think, oh, you poor, poor child. Or maybe you hear that and you think, ooh, yeah, me too. Either way, I know that you know either personally or someone close to you who goes through this kind of struggle often. For a long time, what I thought was true was that my only worth measured against my greatest achievement and that my goodness and value derived from my efforts, my victories, my successes. So when I hear the man in our gospel passage today ask, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I'm like, yeah, what do I got to do? Give me the checklist. I'm ready. Don't we all want to know? What's it going to take? And when Jesus says eventually, you lack one thing, My soul is kind of crushed for that man who was by his own reports good. He'd done everything he could to abide by the commandments of God, to live a faithful life, to attend to the letter of the law and his own actions. And he still lacks. We call this the parable of the rich man but it's significant to note that we don't actually know he's rich until after this exchange. Until the middle of the passage, we only know that he is a man who reveres Jesus. He approaches and kneels. He earnestly seeks wisdom from someone he perceives to be a great teacher of his time. He is faithful. He's kept the commandments since his youth. He is, in essence, all of us, each of us. He represents you and me and everyone else who's just trying to do their best to be a good person. And Jesus looks upon him and loves him. Loves him, the scripture says, and still He says, you are lacking one thing. The criticism of wealth that we hear today is not just the literal condemnation we read about. It is not just that some people have much while many people have nothing. It is the illusion of power and control. It is the fantasy that we have some say over our eternal reward, that we can earn our place in the kingdom of God by our own individual action, that we can work hard enough, save up enough, become important enough to matter. The wealth of this world is achievement-oriented. 
and we think we can make up for what we lack by earning enough to fill the void, to become whole, to be complete. You lack something. I lack something. And if you're anything like me or the man from our passage this morning, it likely has to do more with the initial question that was asked than anything else. It's got a couple of false premises. The man asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And there's two things wrong with that question. The first is that it's selfish. It's only concerned with himself, not what, what must we do, not what can I do for others, but what can I do for my own benefit? The second is that it presumes individual action can make it happen. How can I control my own reality through my actions or decisions? And what Jesus ultimately says later in this passage is that that's impossible. It is impossible for mortals to save themselves. We cannot do it. We have tried. It is only by the grace of God that we are raised to new life in heaven. And this isn't This isn't a cheap grace, right? It's not a free pass to act however you want and to care about nothing because you're gonna go to heaven anyway. That's cheap grace. This is different. This God's grace is about helping us know, helping us know the inbreaking of the kingdom of heaven here and now so that we might not have to wait Right? We might not have to wait until we die and are raised again to know God's goodness and mercy and everlasting love and perfection, but that we might know it right now through our communities of faith and hope. I think we get a hint at this truth in the question, right? We've said that it has two incorrect premises, that it's not about me and it's not about doing. But is there a way that the question can help us know what God's grace is actually like? For the first time this week, I realized that our translation does not say, what must I do to earn eternal life? It says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Our concept of inheritance, at least in the Western world, it's not about earning or doing. It's about belonging. Belonging to a family. And even if you know it's coming, even if your family sits you down and says, like Mufasa in The Lion King, one day this will all be yours, it doesn't change that you were born into it, that you are worthy of it just by virtue of your belonging. That's what it is for us too. This grace of God is an inheritance that we receive. Whether we are ready or not, whether we have worked hard for it or not, whether we deem ourselves worthy or not, it is freely given by virtue of our belonging to this family, the family of God. And the only thing that we're asked to do is use the gifts, the beauty, the talent, the grace, the love, the mercy, the redemption that we have been freely given to help other people belong as well. To say, 
There's more than enough to go around. This is not just for me. It's so good, you've got to have it too. Come on. What you lack and what I lack are not necessarily the same. We fill them, we try to fill them many of the same ways. But I guarantee you, we are not meant to fill those voids on our own through our own efforts. We are to follow Jesus, not alone, not to earn anything, but to belong, to know the gift of wholeness and connectedness by belonging to something bigger than us. When we have too many artifacts of the material world, right, too much pride or too much judgment or too much wealth or too much of anything that the temporal world says should hold our values and worth, when there is too much of that, it wiggles its way in between us and literally and figuratively disconnects us from one another. It diminishes the full potential of knowing our inheritance here and now, of knowing the fullness of the kingdom and family of God here and now. The rich man is all of us. He is each of us trying to just check off all the boxes of good behavior and proper decorum and social acceptabilities in order to climb the ladder to heaven. But God doesn't ask us to work our way up because we can't. It is impossible. Instead, God comes to us in Jesus Christ. God meets us here and gathers us up into one body and claims us as his own, as his family, as his inheritors. Jesus loved the rich man, and he loves us too. He doesn't want us to have to wait for the kingdom of heaven to know that deep belonging and wholeness that we get from the presence of God through each other. He wants us to have it here and now. And so he reminds us that God made possible that which man could not. A miracle indeed, and one we all receive as our inheritance. Amen.